Today, I want to welcome you to uh, one of the um, first, um, well, the first public event and what we're calling the Entanglement Project um, this year. This is, this is something we're trying out for the year. And the Entanglement Project includes three intertwining strands that address the historical, cultural, and political shifts in understanding the entangled concepts of race, climate, and health that underpin any notion of something like solution to contemporary problems, but also look to innovations in learning to live and concepts of political futurity that emerge in literature, philosophy, and the arts. Lack of primary health care made increasingly visible by COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, police violence and mass incarceration, the housing crisis created through evictions, repossessions, repossessions and catastrophic climate events like Katrina, everyday ecological damage, created by massive temperature shifts in previously forested areas and black neighborhoods where highways were created. Unequal beneficiaries of infrastructural change, lead-laden lead water, access to good education, opportunities afforded by it, sites of injustice in which changes in the law, in the medical system, and in climate-related policy could, of course, make a difference. But the humanities is often largely absent from the table when solutions, for example, like this, to these problems are formulated. As such, questions of what constitutes justice, health, or an ecology in which one can thrive, for example, all of which are philosophical, imaginative, and historically and culturally shaped concepts debated within the humanities are neglected. We aim in this, in this entanglement project to shift the discussion shaping future decision making um, uh, um, for a start, but also to enrich our own conversations, to create a robust humanities inflected vocabulary conce and conceptual to toolbox through which to articulate the meanings, the shifting meanings of race, climate and health moving forward. If we might state the obvious, no health without medical access, no justice without the law, no shelter without a healthy ecology. We might also say that the arts and humanities are crucial in understanding the inadequacy of the correlation among the terms justice and the law, medicine and health, infrastructural change, and thriving ecologies. Um, today, I want to um, just uh, um, thank Michaeline for, um, for being responsible for one of these strands, um, even though she's actually on leave at the moment. Um, uh, so a very special thank you. And I'm going to uh, Im invite her, oh, actually, sorry, Chris also needs to just say something before we invite Michaeline to come up and, um, and introduce the project and our speaker today. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for your attendance here today and those out there in cyberspace. My name is Michaeline Critchlow, and I teach in the Department of African and African American Studies. I had to coordinate this lab with lots of logistical and ideational assistance, especially from the assistant director, Jessica Doyle, a PhD candidate in Romance Studies. Um, thanks to everyone at FHI for facilitating this event, Professor Ranji Khanna for the idea of the Entanglement Seminar, and bring in Professors Wald, Philween Sar, and myself to brainstorm its forms into existence. Thanks to Christina Chia for her diligent support, Michael Pasquale, Eric Basto, Pam Montgomery for all that you've done to make things click. And thank you out there in cyberspace, Patricia Northover from the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Social and Economic Studies at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica, who's helped to shape our thinking on these questions. The Climate Lab, as you'll see on the FHI website, is a response to the demands of the times regarding the scientific claims being made now that humans are responsible for the turbulence experienced by the planet manifest in global warming, the disappearance of the species and the accompanied decimation of lands and seas 
through varying projects of expulsion and brutality, as Sas Saski Assassin has highlighted. Referred to as the Anthropocene, though several other names such as Capital Ocene, Plantation Ocene, or Chulucene have been applied, all claiming to offer a more precise rendering of these developments or these catastrophes and drawing attention to the origins, histories, and uneven geographies of these disastrous outcomes from the climate crisis. We can trouble these specific characterizations even as we recognize their rationales. We grasp their overlapping connectivities for surely the rise of capitalism until the genocidal project result, uh, result in the death of millions of native peoples and the outright theft of their lands in all of those territories renamed Americas and other colonized territories and peoples, for example, India, Africa, Asia, including the Caribbean. Indeed, the theft of the lands from many of these sites occasioned the establishment of plantations operated by the labor of enslaved Africans managed by their European overlords. All these nomenclatures point to the metabolic rift, which Marx recognized as a fundamental shift in the relationship between our human species and the rest of nature. In our contemporary moment, this has become far more severely ruptured in ways that represents a planetary emergency for all its inhabitants. Yet the effects are being borne more heavily and dramatically by those dwelling in geographies deemed global south, which in our use encompasses both the economically dispossessed and racially subjugated persons and places found in highly industrialized countries of the global north and the former colonies, which were once called third world or developing countries. So the lab seeks to explore the linkages among three pivotal and simultaneously occurring global catastrophes, namely criminality, displacement, and the pandemic, toward developing a set of principles regarding decolonization as an ethical approach to climate change. These three elements, identified in Denise Ferreira da Silva's conceptual essay, Ancestral Claims We Concur, are constitutive effects of the long durée process of colonialism and slavery, and therefore enable a far more holistic apprehension of climate change. As several analysts, including Walter Mignolo, Catherine Walsh, Olufemi Taiwo, Donna Haraway, Malcolm Ferdinand, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Marisol de la Cadena, Cadena insist climate catastrophe catastrophe can't be divorced from the constitutive context of the global colonial racial empire powered by capitalism and facilitated by a hegemonic core or states in the global north who profit handsomely from the degradations of peoples and lands of the global south. Can I have some water, please? <laughs> um, we are honored to have as our guest, Professor Denise Ferreira da Silva, trained as a sociologist, I believe, <laughs> but perhaps better known as a philosopher, political theorist, a practicing artist, as well as an art critic. Her work addresses the ethical, political challenges of the global present. She's the author of the much cited Toward the Global Idea of Race, Adivija Impagava, my Portuguese is dreadful. Um, and Living Co Commons and co-editor of, with Paula Chakravarti of Race, Empire, and the Crisis of the Subprime. Her most recent text is Unpayable Debt, which she describes as a debt that someone owes but is not hers to pay. Much like the debt through climate change that impacts the global south more ferociously, broadly interpreted, but is the responsibility of those who pollute, mutilate via carbon emissions, displacements, and other brutalities. All that contributing to global warming and the disappearance of both human and non-human species. Much like the debt 
that Haiti's revolutionary leader, Pierre Boyer, transacted to pay to France in 1825 for property plantations lost and to secure recognition of its independence. And here I'm going along with the argument of Alex Dupuis in his interpretation of the ways in which the revolutionary leaders held property to be sac sacrosanct. Imagine this after enslavement and the death of more than 250,000 enslaved. Professor Ferreira da Silva's several articles have been published in leading inter interdisciplinary journals such as social texts, theory, culture and society, social identities, law, review, theory and event, the black scholar to name a few. Her artistic works, experimental films include the films Serpent Rain, Four Waters, Deep Implicancy in collaboration with Arjuna Newman and the relational art practices, Poetical Readings and Sense in Salon. She has exhibited and lectured at major art venues such as the Pompidou Center in Paris, the Whitechapel Gallery in London, Guggenheim in New York, Guggenheim and MoMA in New York, and has also written for major art events in the Venice Biennale, Liverpool Biennale, and Sao Paulo Biennale, to name a few. And last year in October or, no or November, was commissioned to present a film at COP26 at the Climate uh, Change Conference held in Glasgow, Scotland. This summer, Professor Ferrer de Silva was nominated by Gayatri Spivak for the International Chair in Contemporary Philosophy at the Department of Philosophy at University of Paris 8, an appointment that will run for the spring semester in 2023. After that stint, we hope to see more of her at Duke. <laughs> well, thank you, Professor Ferreira de Silva, for accepting the invitation and to collaborate with us in this experimental lab to offer this public discussion as well as participate in the workshop later on with our core group, a very exciting group of students and faculty. And may I be so bold as to speak on behalf of many of us here today that your ideas on the political dimensions of global blackness, raciality and now linked to climate crisis, has been exquisitely generative, path-breaking and productive. And your efforts to address and unpack the socio-philosophical underpinnings of raciality, a word that you yourself coined in the world, um, the dasine of racial being in the world, so to speak, of the enduring force and challenge of laboring in a world sutured by ideas, discourses, and commonsensical beliefs and practices that continue to represent the human via the Eurocentric godness, pointing out the violences that such practices foster and the continuing disavowal of all our complex interconnectivities and rhizomic lives of differences through hierarchical renditions. Although Professor Ferrer de Silva was not trained at the World System Headquarters in Binghamton University, Michaeline said nostalgically and curiously, facetiously, her work nonetheless, and many of you know, is global in scope and rooted and routed through and with locales and their singular socio-economic and socio-cultural formations, otherwise known as personal and country, regional experiences, particularly those coming from Brazil, her birthplace, as well as her current location in North America, and of course, all those other places and experiences in Europe and elsewhere. For instance, when she wrote the seminal text to the global idea of race, she said, that she was tired of the existing race relations literature. She said, and I quote, when I began this project, and I had only a vague idea of what I wanted to accomplish. I was unsatisfied with how the concept of race was deployed in sociological studies that attempted to explain the social conditions prevailing in the larger collectivities 
to which I belong juridically. As a Brazilian national and a US permanent resident, though race is so obviously a crucial dimension of the economic and symbolic moment. I was tired of statements such as, Brazil has a multiple system of racial classification while the US has a binary one. Americans are obsessed with race while Brazilians repress it. Unlike African Americans, black Brazilians have no race, race consciousness and so on. I wanted to understand, but the sociological arsenal available could not help me. So a philosophy and her uh, renown as a philosopher is fundamentally rooted in these conditions that are um, situated in these various sites, especially Brazil and the US and in Europe, of course. Her presentation today, Ancestral Claims, takes its name from an essay that pronounces on the inseparability of the complex links, simply put, between different socials and naturals, a fecund framing that has been key to the orientation of our climate crisis lab. Please join me in welcoming Professor De Silva. She will speak for roughly 40 minutes, and then we'll respond with our comments and questions in person and those coming from outer space. <laughs> um, thank you, Michael, and for such an amazing, kind um, introduction. As usual, I just feel like I can only, you know, not fail before. So, so such beautiful uh, description of, yeah, I mean, of the work that we are all um, doing here. And I obviously would like to thank everybody involved in the organization of this event, and Jessica, Michael, Eric, Christina, and I'm obviously forgetting somebody else, but also Michaeline and Patricia for inviting me to have these conversations on global blackness, which they have, this conversation has been so generative, and we've been doing it for like, what, a year, over a year now, uh, and I have learned um, very much. And I also have learned how to appreciate how much I belong to up there, Binghamton, more than I, <laughs> more than I knew. <laughs> but I think it has a lot to do with the reverberations of, uh, of that particular uh, kind of critique uh, of Marxism in, in Brazil, in the particular as I was growing up, becoming a thinking entity um, in Brazil. And thank, thank you um, to Ranji and the FHI for, um, for hosting this, this group. And I'm really looking forward to the work we'll do together. So what I have to present is, um, well, is always like thinking in progress. Um, so in this, in this particular version brings together different pieces um, as, you know, the more I, I think about what I'm trying to do here and the more I share it with others, I can see how the different parts come, come together and how they don't come together. Um, so I'm not gonna say much because then in the text itself, I say what I'm, what I'm trying to do. So let me just get, uh, get started, and, but before I do that, I would like to thank you for being here in this small room, and folks who are on uh, Zoom again, still, also, you know, doing, doing this. Um, but, but, well, every time, I, every time I try a different way to present, to organize, to deliver the main proposition that I have to share with you here, I end up with a recitation of what sometimes I call um, global catastrophes or global, global events. But neither of these terms, neither catastrophe nor event, I think adequately captures the combination of urgency and indifference with which these circumstances are met. So in this very same urgency and indifference is what moves my thinking here. So whatever name is chosen to identify them, whatever qualifier is chosen to justify their selection or specify their relevance, there is no question that these occurrences host the most urgent ethical political issues of our time. So what are they? Michaeline mentioned um, three of them. 
criminality, the discursive and institutional mechanisms of criminalization of non-white, non-European persons, places, and populations in North America, in the Middle East, in Latin America, and in the Caribbean. These mechanisms that produce and proliferate and profit from juridic figures such as the gangbanger, the welfare king, the drug dealer, the terrorist, the, the illegal immigrant. The other is, again, um, Michael mentioned this, uh, displacement, the displacement of populations in the global south, people fleeing local and regional wars of capital, a catastrophe that is inseparable from the devastation of livelihood provoked by the latest economic development strategies, which seem to be marked by this return of the economies of the global south to a focus on extractivism and agriculture. While I was in Brazil uh, two months ago, I learned that the, the country has deindustrialized about 30%. Uh, in the past five or six years. That happened so quickly. Um, it must be a, a project. But anyway, this time around, these activities are in the hands of, of course, global corporations who work many times through local farmers. So my, my driver, the person who came to pick me up last night uh, from the airport, who is from Kenya, he told me all about his uh, business plan back home, um, which is to go back to be a local pig farmer to work for British multinational, multinational corporations. And as a contractor, uh, and as they, these corporations work through contractors, they take advantage of the low wages and of other uh, difficult circumstances without having to pay to run the risks uh, because they can always all move to another country and hire other contractors. Uh, and then, yes, that is the pandemic and, and global warming. And the global and racial distribution of the damages they cause, that, that alone, I think, makes my case. So I'm not going to say much more about, about them. So what I have to share with you today is something uh, simple. Um, I could call it a case for, you know, I'm making a case for the kind of shift at the level of thinking that I think would allow us to appreciate and respond to the urgency expressed in these in this four events, criminality, displacement, the pandemic, and the climate crisis or global warming. The response is obviously a call for for decolonization, right? Because decolonization is the only possible signifier, signified for anything that can be taken as an as a descriptor for what so many mean through under the name of justice, be that also under social justice or global justice. And this so because decolonization is the most um, is the only adequate response to these um, challenging events. And that's so because these catastrophes, these events recall materially but, and that dramatically, they recall colonial and racial subjugation because the land extraction and labor expropriation enabled by colonial and racial subjugation are materially constitutive and therefore active in these current global circumstances. Not as that from which these derive as the past of this present or, or, or the cause for these effects, but as that which is operative in all of them beyond the separations of space-time. So the whole point of the, the exercise is to, simply to say that if we are to attend to the demand for decolonization and appreciate its ethical force, it is needed that we make a shift, make a turnaround at the level, um, not only at the level of principles, or perhaps not even at the level of principles, and definitely we should not try and reconfigure the transparent eye again. The shift must be, it must occur underground, uh, infrastructurally. 
So as a contribution to the kind of groundwork necessary for appreciating the demand for decolonization and for contemplating the kind of radical, the kind of radical reorientation of thinking it requests, in my written and visual work, I have been speculating with two, two ideas which basically um, they, are not, they are not quite concepts. I call one an image of existence, corpus infinitum, and the other I call a description or a descriptor for existence, deep implicancy. And what I have to say is kind of like about those, those ideas, but I'm not going to present an elaboration of those terms. Um, but I just, but they will be there in the talk anyway. So what I'll do then is just move on to recall the infrastructure, those, um, those phrases, those terms, those ideas, those images, whatever, descriptors, however we name them, what they try to, um, they seek to dissolve, to undo. So the point of departure here is um, uh, the obsession, the acknowledgement that the country, I think, the unit of a unity of a perception that produce a synthet synthetical unity out of the synthesis created by the imagination, that figure there, I think, is inscribed in the grammar and lexicon that constitute descriptions of what happens and what exists of both human and non-human kind. What I mean basically is that the Kantian version of the subject operates underground and infrastructurally in the onto-epistemological pillars, separability, determinacy, and sequentiality, and in the descriptors, formality, and efficacy that organize our writing and thinking. That it does so is a consequence of the image of existence, uh, ordered nature, that undergirds the Kantian program. And here I'm referring to what he calls, in his critique of the power of judgment, the law of specification of nature, the one that assumes in behalf of, of an order of nature cognizable for our understanding in the division of, that it makes of its universal laws when it would subordinate a manifold of particular laws to these. That was a quote. This is the sole and fundamental guide for the judgment, which is the power that articulates and operates in the three branches of the Kantian program. This, is a, this principle is the precondition for both the determinative scientific, for actually not both, more than two, for the determinative scientific statements, the reflective aesthetic statements, and the imperative ethic statements um, as designed, as each of these Parts of philosophy are designed by Immanuel Kant. So a crucial step in the direction of thinking needed for an adequate anti-colonial analysis of the global context is to expose how the I think is at work in the very descriptive terms that compound our discourse. If we are to take one, one of them, like uh, global warming, for instance, which is the one that interests us more in, immediately here, we find this the two auto epistemological descriptors, formality and efficacy, very much at work in the critical literature on global warming. So it is at work in, the, in the presentations of concepts such as the Anthropocene and the Capitalocene. And that's so, and in, in the concepts that have been um, deployed to locate a new ge geological era one that resulted from the proliferation and intensification of human economic activities and technologies um, and the consequences they had over the, the planet. Now, in the case of these terms, for, in, for instance, those who deploy them and those who criticize uh, their deployment, their you know, uncritical deployment of the same terms, such as uh, Donna Haraway, what is usually missed is how the Eurocentric anthropos prevails in the, very, the, inter, in the infrastructures that support their own critical thinking. That is, the descriptors of existence, uh, formality, and efficacy 
operate in the empirical or material conditions Anthropocene and Capitalocene are designed to capture and reinterpret. On the one hand, formality is at work in how the human, the presumed order of nature, order of nature is in the procedure developed for establishing the ages of Earth which inscribe linear time into the planet while at the same time allowing for the naming of its different moments of different ages. Formality, one of the epistemological descriptors that sustain claims to knowledge with certainty, formality maps the I think onto the planet because the naming procedure uh, employed in, uses methods, concepts, and formulations of the science life. The naming procedure for geological ages uses the biological classificatory system the French naturalist Georges Cuvier designed in the early 19th century, in which the European Caucasian race's organic form governs as it is the model and the most perfect living formation. Um, living formation, it governs the understanding of the forms and functions of other living beings, which would be and that would, would be later combined with Darwin's temporal evol evolutive sentence that charts the development of life, and which, in which, which in there op operates as both the efficient and the final cause that accounts for the particularity and the variety of parts and movements and of living beings. So, for instance, the unofficial phases, layers of the planet, the first 600 million years, remain so, remain unnamed, because it is, has not been possible yet to find a living being that would allow for its uh, classification. The, the later four billion years have been identified precisely because of because evidence of bacterial life forms being being found. Efficacy, of course, is the primary ontoepistemological descriptor is an analysis of, the glo of global warming, um, whether they call it the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene, or do not use any of these terms. The crucial efficient, efficient cause in that is obviously human, in particular human economic activities and technologies, um, large-scale economic activities, agricultural production, industrialization, all of which are, as we know, uh, dependent on extraction and uh, expropriation. So towards the end of this interstructural rule of the I think, uh, or maybe as a contribution to the task of demolishing the, its ontoepistemological empire, an empire that is built on formality and efficacy, I propose just this question um, that may guide a, you know, different kinds of exercises. But here are presented through a few. What if instead of naming yet another geological age and rendering human exceptionality the final explanation for what we know, we know results from human activities, one attended to the activities themselves? And maybe more importantly, what if instead of considering these activities in terms of efficacy, we attend to what I'm calling the infinite material capacity they profit from, that is, to that which is intrinsic to everything that exists. And that would include transfer of constitutive energy as heat, kinetic energy, and as work, potential energy, Phase transition from solid, liquid, to gas, plasma, etc. Transition from matter into energy and vice versa. And transduction or transformation from one type of energy into another. But how, how would it be possible uh, to begin to, an ex to think along, along those lines? How to think matter without the image of the body, of an extended solid, something that alone occupies one particular place. How to think of materiality as an inherent infinite capacity, transfer, transition, transformation. This, of course, would require a shift at the level of the imagination, um, one towards an image of existence that does not prefigure linearity, 
as in formality and efficacy, but attend to that which is intrinsic, inherent to um, materiality. A shift that I find both fascinating and, and necessary. And what I'm going to share with you more now are three ways through which I try to convey what such a shift entails. First, I have this uh, thought experiment, which is designed to expose and expel linearity. Then I have some comments on energy transfer. And third, I have some speculations which have been inspired by the artwork of the Brazilian artist Maria Teresa Alves. And let me just tell you, I'm going to be saying the same thing over and over again. I'm going to repeat the same thing three times uh, in different ways. So if you find it repetitive, it is. But as I, as I also said, I think I said or suggested before, it is a task for the imagination. So some repetition is necessary. And what this is doing here, I don't know, but anyway. This is what happened. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to show all the slides. I'm only showing the slides at the end, but I guess maybe what's here before. Ah, that's a good one now. Let's see if that is okay. No, I didn't skip, no. I'll keep this one. This one is good for the first experiment. So this um, thought experiment, that it's Obviously, an, I'm calling it a thought experiment because it's basically an exercise on abstraction. Um, one that goes after linearity at, as it is presumed in the Kantian program, and linearity that as it supports the ontological descriptors. So formality, to give you the idea of a line, you know, a line around, a line around, and the efficacy, the straight line, you know, as you know, which functions. That's why I kept Newton in calculus, like this uh, tool that allows, uh, allows us to measure change in time. Cannot but give a line. Um, and then I will try an experiment which is just as abstract, but that one attends to that which is intrinsic to materiality, um, which I'm calling infinity. So this experiment has uh, two parts. Part one considers the question of how to image unity. A line is needed for that. Uh, and one good discursive reference uh, term is uh, circumscription. So the, the exercise is really how to image uh, something that is circumscribed. You can use, it can be a circle, a triangle, uh, they have the form of a rectangle. A rectangle, um, and I, I like to use the circle because it's the most obvious one. And um, so as you have this image of the circle, I don't have an image of a circle, you just have the image of the circle. You can sprinkle, sprinkle some you know, dots of, in the circle and then you try to connect one dot from one side to another dot from the other side, exactly in the opposite sides. And as you try, no matter which side you're talking about, if you can say that a circle has sides, um, if you draw, if you want to connect the, the two dots going through the center, you draw a straight line. Uh, you can try all the different times. If you go through the center, you draw a straight line. But then if you try to avoid the center and try to connect dots on different sides, you are going to draw a same circle. Um, there is no other way. I mean, you try, you can try all different ways using pen and paper or using, um, or just using your mind. What you get is, um, is a same circle if you try to avoid the center and the straight line if you um, go through the center. And again, that can be shown as a mental image in an actual drawing or in an equation, which is the one I don't have here, which is the equation for a, the equation for a circle or the equation for a semicircle. Through the equation, the numerical representation, it is possible to find actually any position 
in the in the context in the in that circle without having to know whether there is a dot there or not uh, so the equation tells me when I try you know, when I try and solve it where the opposite side of my dot is regardless if there is anything over there and then once I'm able to determine that I'm no longer I don't need to draw a line to connect the two points all I need is to know the center how to know is the center and the radius of the circle yeah, I should. I don't have this. I should have it because it's such a good one. No, it goes all cosmic. I don't have that. So the point here is to emphasize that drawing a semicircle or drawing a line, if you're avoiding the circle or if the center of the of the of the figure, or if you are going through the center, is something necessary. Um, Part two considers how to image existence as infinity. Here I have the same dots, um, but now something's changed. They're dots, but they're not really fixed points in a flat image, but they're more like uh, parts of components of a volume, of a, of a sphere or of a cube. And how I go about them also change because instead of trying to connect them, I just pay attention to what's happening um, to them in that, in that context. And I know, and, and more, more particularly, I pay attention at what is happening in between them, in the spaces between them. When I wonder about what's happening in the space between them, I know that, you know, vibration is taking place. And I can anticipate it because I also know that it's really more likely that the sphere or the cube are not in at an absolute zero temperature because that's not found, has not been found anywhere on the in the universe, only in labs, scientists are able to bring some, the temperature down to absolute zero. So I know that transfer of energy is happening because heat, uh, which is transfer of internal kinetic energy, is happening. And because heat is taking place, all of those points there, which are no longer points, they are little particles, they are releasing phonons and or photons. Transition, transfer, and transformation of energy involve all, involve all of these um, different aspects of energy of matter energy connection. They involve um, the release of internal kinetic energy that takes place just because of the way of existence. They involve the release, the expenditure of uh, potential energy, which is work when you try to do, um, to do something. And they also may involve transduction or the trans conversion of one kind of energy into another, like this microphone here will convert my sound, the sound of my voice into electronic signals, which will then be converted back into sound by the speakers in people's home as they are watching here um, from here via Zoom. Anyway, so like the previous one, this image can also be formalized in different ways classically through equations that present thermodynamics, which is the measure of the amount of internal kinetic energy being transferred between dots or between my fingers. Quantum field theory would translate it into mathematical objects and equations which, which would be used to determine different properties of the particles, momentum, energy. Um, you know, the particles that constitute the dots, which are no longer dots, but atoms, molecules, or even electrons. Photons, phonons. Anyway, so you may be wondering, so what, why, why the, 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 the experiment? 
Um, so what I'm what I'm after is to, re to release the Kanchan program, to release to release our thinking, our imagination, actually from from the I thinking, from the I think, um, in the ways in which I hold that it ha the hold and the hold that it has is expressed in the formalization of what happens and what exists under concepts and categories, including those that expose the conditions for the accumulation of capital and the operations of the colonial racial cis heteropatriarchal matrix, meaning our dear critical tools. So this, the experiment explicitly targets the law of specification of nature, that is the framework for scientific knowledge, the aesthetic, and the ethical program. And which gives the, I think, its um, distinguishing capacity. Now, the second part of the experiment recalls existence um, because the dots are not approached as fixed points on a plane, they are tiny components of, of a, 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 a sphere. So when they, in, in, in being so, they come into existence, right? It's no longer about something that it's only um, Im imagined or possible or framed because of a notion of circumscription. And as such, because they come into existence, they cannot be solely described formally or linearly, right? The one-on-one -on -one connection that obtains efficacy. So that's, that's a shift that moves, um, displays the I think, because it is, because it is not, actually. The I think is not so quickly recalled in that second part of the experiment. Because while it yields an, Im an image which is as abstract as the geometrical figures that since Galileo have supported the claims of modern philosophers, especially when they are translated into mathematical demonstrations, proves it does not picture an empty delimited space with a postulated center. As an image of existence, it pictures an unlimited but full context without a center, presumed or marked, and one in which that which exists is there, is connected to everything else, not through a line, but through a mode of existing, such as vibrating dots that release their internal kinetic energy as heat or potential energy as work into the gaps. And these energies then could be then absorbed, refracted, or diffracted by other dots, but it doesn't go anywhere. So now this is the third, uh, the, second, the second one, calor and labor. Every existence emits ele electromagnetic radiation as long as it is, you know, its temperature is greater than absolute zero. And as I just said, that is nothing that is at the ab absolute zero temperature as far as uh, I know now. Internal kinetic energy, which depends on mass and speed, like any other form of energy, can be transformed into another form of energy. And how to do so without the infrastructure of the, I think, it, and it, sorry, and it allows us to think without the infrastructure of the, I think. So how, how is this material capacity, how does, would it inform you know, the ways in which we talk about global warming. Different ways, but the one I'm primarily interested here is in a description of what happens in the ve of the very process of generating greenhouse gases, that is in the transformation of ener energy and transduction of potential or internal kinetic energy that play, takes place when something is applied to provoke an alteration or something labor, which is on something, sorry, labor, or when something exists alongside something else that also exists, that is heat or, or calor. So even without a good grasp of what is at work in global warming, we know that it results from the emission and accumulation of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, which have raised the temperature of the lower uh, layer of the atmosphere, uh, the troposphere. The rise in temperature results from these gases absorption and emission of infrared radiation 
which is the band of the electromagnetic um, spectrum at which we all vibrate as we emit heat. Now, the increased accumulation of gases above uh, the Earth has to do basically with increased extraction of matter from Earth in the form of fossil fuels and soil nutrients to feed uh, crops and livestock. The accumulation of gas then is inseparable from the expropriation of land and labor necessary for accessing fossil fuels and uh, soil. Whether we locate its efficient cause earlier with the emergence of, agric of agriculture or in the later 18th century with the Industrial Revolution, there is no question that a certain concentration of means of production and um, of access to raw materials respond for the excess of greenhouse gases. And I don't need to say much, I know that coloniality, which is the mode of governance that relies on the depo deployment of total violence to ensure expropriation of internal energy of lands and bodies, coloniality has facilitated this concentration for over 500 years now, nearly. That being the case, it is not unreasonable to point to the fact that the accumulation of these gases also expresses materially the extent and intensity of the degree of concentration of expropriated kinetic energy facilitated by coloniality and other juridic economic mechanisms of state capital. As for evidence of the intensity and the extent of this expropriation of internal energy, we can just recall the levels of dispossession in the global south. But let me try and make this point again now with uh, commentary on the artwork of the Brazilian artist Maria Teresa Alves. So I'll go. All the th nice things I didn't show you because because I'm trying to avoid using PowerPoint, but when you talk about artwork, then <laughs> there is no escaping it, and it's a good thing. Um, you can spend some time with uh, what Teresa, uh, Maria Teresa Alves says about, about her work. Reflecting on Maria Teresa Alves, the return of the lake, on its commitment not to let what has happened disappear in the flow of linear time, had me considering how the abstract linearity that is time is be has been so, so crucial, so crucial for contending with the reverberations of this never-ending act, as Maria Teresa's work shows. The act is the colonial act. Every colonial act as is a theft. Colonialism is ongoing, as she proposes. Ongoing, timeless theft. How to think in such a way, in such a way, in, in, in that way, this way that violates the linear, linear separation and progression that are given by space-time and the linearity that, that it um, gives, obtains. Alves, ret Alves' return of the lake inspires speculations on, for, this, for instance, how to image time as something sorry, other than a flow in one direction, which is also a question of how to think, how to make sense of what we call change without linearity, without Newton's equations, um, without calculus, um, without separation, and also without assuming that, you know, Heraclitus, Heraclitus' comment on the river, that even though it changes, the water flows is still the same river. How to think of the river and say, yes, of course, why would it be different, even, why even ask the question of whether or not it's the same river or even the same water. The return of the lake inspires thinking that about what, what has gone as inseparable from what remains, thinking non-linearly 
without separability, without the infrastructure, the infrastructures that need and yield abstraction, separation, determination, decision. Thinking, for instance, with water, not as flow, or in terms of quantity, but thinking of water as something that is in the composition of things, and also is what permeates most things, everything, the planet itself, 71% water, and our bodies, 60% 60 water. More importantly, even thinking of water also as another presentation of matter, and along with it, thinking with all the presentations of matter, earth, air, fire, as phases, solid, gas, liquid. If we do that, then it's possible to describe what, what exists and what happens without separation, without the need for determination, without presumption of development, without space-time separability. If thinking begins like so, it is possible to think both at the same time, that yes, the water of, the la of Lake Chalco has been extracted, but the Chico indigenous community's claim to that water is not only a claim to possession, which is that logic, the logic of economic value, and also the logic that is tied to time theirs, and indigenous epistemologists already posited. That is, is an ancestral claim. They are the water, bodies composed by water and also by everything that grew in Chico because of the water, the plants, the fish, the birds. Actually, if we think change in terms of phase transition, the same water changing into solid, liquid, gas, plasma, and transduction shifting from one form of energy into another, you know, the microphone transforming uh, electro waves into sound waves, or the other way around, and that there and you think that the Chico community's ancestors' body, bodies were composed by what grew there because of this water. So when the water was extracted, parts of them, which are also parts of the land, were taken elsewhere. That is their claim. And that cannot be measured because it is everything. That means that we think two things at the same time. First, extraction and total violence that enables it, ongoing theft of, colonial, of economic dispossession, and second, what I call redecomposition, the fact that the water remains physically as their bodies, the trees, and other things that exist in Chico because the lake has been there. So here we return to the same point about the colonization, the wealth as that has been accumulated by the descendants of the occupiers, of the settlers in this land, the wealth that was sent back to Europe in the form of objects, but also of raw materials that entered in the initial accumulation of capital as industrial capital. Stolen wealth has been transformed in so many ways, is also composed of that water, of Lake, Lake Chalcos. What has been extracted remains transduced into money and now into these virtual financial objects that prevail in global capital. If we take both into account then, we can think of the return of the lake along different lines. It is not the return of a possession, again, it's not. It is the return of a constitutive part of the community, like the return of a, of a limb. It is also because the wealth yielded by what was extracted entering the composition of what exists, not only in Europe, but el everywhere. The return is also a homecoming of sorts. It is the actualization of a deep implicacy. So it cannot be monetized, only monetized. It cannot be calculated. It cannot be just resolved as a loss or a kind of gain. So what I'm trying to get at is that thinking without the separations of linearity and ways of creating meaning, it imposes an and permits that thinking can give another appreciation of indigenous claims call for decolonization and black persons and populations demands for reparations. What has been, what's been demanded is a return of something that has never completely disappeared. Something I repeat that has become part of all that exists as the flesh and blood of global capital and of the conditions of existence it has yielded, including, well, global warming. 
Thank you for the patience. Attention. Thank you, Denise. Um, I have a very flat-footed question. Can you help me understand, as someone who is not trained in philosophy, precisely what this methodology does for you? I understand by the end what the, the proposition is. But again, as someone who doesn't think this way, and we, we sort of had these kinds of conversations, mm -hmm. I think, last year, it would really help me to understand the mechanics <laughs> of what it is you're doing in order to get to this mm -hmm. place, which I think other people get to, but differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so maybe I could get to, maybe I could start from the end of what, of what you said. Um, so what is the place, right? Right. I mean, the question is, where is, where is that? A, where is the place at which I would like to to get? And what is um, what would uh, this image, this way of approaching, of conceiving, of considering, even of wondering about existence, what would it entail in terms of that which is um, that which which is most urgent? Um, in our both in terms of you know the intellectual tasks we devote ourselves and uh, in terms of the political work, not that the intellectual is not political, but the political work, other kinds of political works in which we are, in which we are involved. Um, so it gets at the problem that at least what something that for me has been a problem for a long time now it's ridiculous if I say, but it's been like almost 40, 40 years, which has to do, a pro the problem as I, as I, as it comes in, as it came into my mind and became, and I became obsessed with it, it has two mom moments. One is a, is a problem, a problem that is a political problem, a problem uh, of how to present uh, the demands made by you know, black Brazilian population or indigenous peoples in such a way that it is recognized as political, as proper, as a, as a challenge to the structures of state capital, as, um, as a questioning of its infrastructure, and, and how to do so, not this, uh, this from a position of outside, but actually from the that way of being inside that blackness signals, right? So that's that was the political organizing and all the different um, strategies that I could I can see different for modes of presentation of of the the program, right? And uh, in terms of the set of demands and in terms of who it's being addressed, addressing the state, addressing the international community through human rights that happened in the 90s. Now, I don't know who, I mean, people are probably praying Brazil Bolsonaro is not reelected, so different moment. Um, so on the one hand, that. And then always find uh, that, that the, the program was transformed, translated into something that wasn't properly, properly political. There is a separation between what's political and what's not, but more fundamentally there is a separation produced by raciality between the proper political subjects and the ones which are not, right? Because the, they should do not sometimes coincide, but not, not necessarily. And then um, more recently, the question became more of an, an ethical one, right? thought more less in terms of demands for participation or demands for uh, rights, demands for equal equality, but well, demands for equality, but under the banner of justice. And again, the same, the same limitation is there. Um, so I think everyone who's been involved in, you know, mobilization, anti-slavery, anti anti-colonial, the, even the more, um, how do I say, less, um, less interesting demands for inclusion. I think the, they're pretty, pretty intelligent, right? The, and the work, and serious work has, has been done. And, you know, we have 
libraries of critiques that say the same thing as you said. We are trying to get at that at that point, and yet has it doesn't it doesn't work. So my question is, if it is not in, if it is not in how we use the tools, the critical tools. Um, so if it's not because we, we choose the wrong ones, or it's not because we, or we use them incorrectly, where is the problem? Where is the moment when um, a demand for uh, the return, a demand, a demand for reparations, for instance, is re met with the thing, oh no, that happened back then, I have nothing to do with it. My, uh, you know, my great, great grandfather has something to do with it. So I, yeah, so for a while now, I don't know how long time, I have started thinking that maybe it has to do with the very, the very terms, the very components, the very matter of our thinking. Maybe the problem is in the concepts and the words themselves, right? In the, that's what I call the infrastructures. But not, in, not only in them in terms of how they're put together by different philosophers or different theories, but in, 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 in their very confection, uh, and then in the, in, the, in the possible structures that are there, um, structures in terms of discursive or grammatical ones that we can make by using, by using them. So this is what I'm after in, in this. So when we're talking about the epistemological pillars or the epistemological descriptors, I'm, I'm after effects effects of that the words have, the terms have, beyond that which they seem to mean nominally. Um, because in many cases, we deploy terms that should have one, you know, that in, in different contexts, they would have one, uh, they would be interpreted in, in, in a certain way. But when it's made in the context for the demand for you know, decolonization or, or reparations, it's interpreted differently. Um, so yeah, so it, it, yeah, it's we, what I'm saying is nothing that no one has said before, but what I'm looking at and what I'm experimenting with is with different tools, including what I, I'm calling images of existence that will allow us not only to say it, but actually make it comprehensible for what the claim understandable for what it is, and not for some for for something else, um, and um, so that is something in there because because it's not because in a way the ways that we think actually militate against the kind of image that I'm that, that I, uh, I'm going after. Then yeah, it makes it difficult, isn't it? Because you can't convince somebody of it. That's why now, for instance, this is like is, a, is one text that in which I say the same thing three times in different ways. Because I'm trying to assemble some kind of image that eventually as you read, as you hear through what I say, something like clicks. Oh, this is what she's saying. Um, so when you get to the end and you say, you understand what I'm trying to get at, it's, it's because exactly, I have it three times because I'm hoping like at the end this thing will make some sense. Uh, even if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense linearly. Um, but then I had that issue with toward the global idea of race because when I realized after I had done the dissertation and I was working on revising the book and I realized that I wasn't making a linear argument but I couldn't write a round book so <laughs> the book has three parts, and they kind of map onto each other, <laughs> right? So that's the basic limitation, um, which is how we, we have to tell, we have to present the ideas in such a way as to, that is an unfolding, but then at the same time, that is something that unfolds. But I'm not doing this, right? I want to uh, break this thing apart, and, and that, yeah. Yeah, that makes the exercise difficult, a bit apparently self-indulgent. I don't think it is, <laughs> um, though I like doing it. So, you know, I, I do like doing it. Um, but yes, that's it. Hi, thank you. I actually think I have the same problems with narrative when I'm writing, so I share that. And I think, I'm going to try and do two levels of 
uh, engage your different levels that you're talking about. So I understand your exercise of abstraction to be from the linear to so from the line, the, the circle to the volume, right? To the, the to that energy, which would be the movement, uh, the the action, right? Those are the kind of levels you took us through. And I was wondering if I if you can help me map that then onto Maria Teresa Alves's um, piece in that um, the return, I understand that the return of the lake is the is in a sense the temporality that is not linear, but it is also an energy, it in, entails, it enacts that last phase of that energy, that um, conversion to energy. Am I right so far? Am I explaining, am I following you and reflecting that narrative correctly? Is that? Um, can you, <laughs> okay. can you go back to the return of the lake? Is, so when the, with the project word. of the lake, right, you described as uh, a way to um, understand time that is nonlinear, that is dis diffused through, like the, the lake, come, the water comes, comes back but never disappears, is present in everywhere, but is also stolen. So it is this kind of, but there's also what I was trying to understand then beyond that, that those first two levels, which is from the linear to the volume to the disappearance and the return, is that energy, right, that phase of that, and, and thinking about the collaboration between Maria Teresa Alves and the people of Chico that she was working with. Because I know there's a lot of debate around that in Mexico at the time, sort of like how, what is, what is her relationship with those people in a sense? What's, as, in as much as she, she is also the water of the lake, right, if, if it's everywhere, at the same time, there is a, a certain relation, a certain energy between her and the site and the people who are also involved in that that space that is that you should assign. So that I was trying to bring, <laughs> trying to work with your your exercise and abstraction, but also bring it to the nodes. I guess it would be of the people involved in that project in that particular space, and in its opening up as you were describing it. So I was trying to kind of respect or understand your way of, abs of, mm -hmm. of abstracting. Does that make sense now that I ask the um, question? Sort of like, what's the, what, is, what is the energy, what is the process, what is this exchange of energies to you, to, that she's involved in when it comes to, is there a difference between her involvement with the lake as the, and the people from Chico? Is, are, they, mm -hmm. are they the same nodes in that mm -hmm. flow? Mm -hmm. Or how would you understand them in your mm -hmm. way of understanding mm -hmm. the project? Um, let me, let me see, perhaps I can, um, I can begin from somewhere in the middle where, where the, um, the two, the, the thought experiment meets the speculations on the art piece, right? So, and I, the middle, the middle piece, because that, those are the two ends of it, the middle piece should have, could have done some of of the some work in there, but it doesn't because I didn't design it to do to do that work. So the first piece is highlighting precisely the, this presumed separability, the presumed line that would, for instance, uh, also be present when we separate. Um, I don't know, analysis from speculation or we separate the artist from the academic or the artist from the indigenous people in the community or the Brazilian from the Mexican person, right? Which is what's playing, what's playing out there. So it's going after that, that linearity that then would describe what, whatever happens in that context in terms of relations between things which are separate which is how we understand power, right? Relations of power, power in terms of relations, not forget Foucault, in spite of Foucault, we still see power in that way. Um, so that, that, you know, the having of the, having the two moments highlights one, uh, circumscription, linearity at work. And then I just, you know, move from that, the second one just moves from that slowly to actually actual, to actual existing things instead of thinking of, you know, for forms, we're talking about things that actually exist in that, in that simple, 
And in that context, in, the, in, the, in that moment, I should say, of things that actually exist, you have everything happened at the same, uh, everything happening at the same time. So you can think that Maria Teresa Alves is made out of that something that was transduced, of that water that has been transduced, that the fact that she can actually travel to Chico community is possible because of all of how that water was transduced into money that went to the residences and the funding, the artistic funding that, um, you know, made it possible for her to be there. And then at the same time, she is working there, doing the artwork and talking about the return of the lake, right? Um, and it, it's, it's, it's separate, right, because of the distribution, the distribution of wealth under global capital and what's acceptable to whom. Um, so the, the white Brazilian artist has more access to um, those funds than one would say the indigenous artists from, from that community. But yeah, they are still made out of the same thing. So, the, so I, I've been using the phrase ancestral, ancestral claims. Um, and to me, it is inseparable from unpayable debt in that, in that sense. It doesn't absolve, it's not a celebration of here we are, we are all the same kind of, you know, <laughs> new age <laughs> take on it. Um, it is actually, to me, it's the opposite, right? It's the acknowledgement that that which makes it possible for me to be here is, uh, is a, you know, a transformation, a transformation reduction or a transmutation of the wealth that was generated by the tobacco plantations here in North Carolina, even though I have been to North Carolina a few times. Maybe this is my fourth time coming here. Um, you know, that's it. Um, I don't have, now, now that, that makes me committed to, um, to the call for decolonization right here. Um, as it makes me committed to the call in Brazil. Um, you see, like... No, it's okay. Yeah. Thank you, Denise. I have a very simple comment, and my question is that you would say, yes, that is what I meant, or is it no? That is not <laughs> what I meant. Mm -hmm. But I thank you because what I'm going to say is what I am getting out of your talk. And I think that the return of the land is, is the return of, of the future. And this is mm -hmm. not a game, a war game. A return of the future because what is return is the future that is returned it is the future that has been stopped by, let's say, modernity or Newton, Galileo, etc. And that, I think, is the power of the colonization, or the coloniality as the colonization, and I make the kind of distinction, modernity and modernization, the coloniality and uh, the colonization. And that, I think, is the planetary move, the return of the past of the planet that has been stopped by the idea of the future, one future, that is the problem mm -hmm. you have with linear time, I understand. No? Uh, so that's, my, that's what I got out of your, your, your talk. Um, so I would, I would say what the, this is the return of what could have become had it not been extracted. What's your future? But I think I'm also saying that the climate, the accumulation, that the things accumulating up there is the return of that past, too, of that future. Uh, the accumulation of gases, of greenhouse gases, that excess, the excess extraction, that excess extraction is accumulated and it's coming down. Um, so it's the past and the future are collapsing into what we call a climate crisis. Um, and that's basically what I'm proposing here, nothing else. Uh, in, in, along I those lines. Uh, it's important what I'm going to say, but I forgot. 
is that the cosmology of Western modernity, the physical theory, destituted the now what cosmology. But now what cosmology is present in the return of the lake. I think that you think so? mm -hmm. Okay, I haven't thought about the return of the dead, but yeah, but well, I just think I'm thinking more in terms of the return of the mechanisms of death, of that which they made possible to generate. But they come together, right? I mean, that's way, one way in which they, they absolutely come together. Um, yeah. Thank you. The dead yeah. and the deadly. Hi, Denise. Um, Hi. I want to go back to the question of your method just maybe ask you to say a little bit more about it, but in hearing you answer this question, I was thinking of other, other examples of philosophers who've dealt with a similar problem, although in a very different context. So one of them is Levinas, right? And Levinas's argument that philosophical language does violence to our capacity to speak about otherness and so on. Um, and another one is you know, Deleuze's notion of the image of thought, which may have some relationship to your mm -hmm. concept of the image of existence. So I guess it sounds to me like you're, I mean, for, for both of those figures and, and for deconstruction also, there's a way in which this takes place through, through language, and language is the tool for overcoming also what language imposes as the limits. And it sounded to me like you're trying to think of tools for us to think differently that are, that are not only linguistic tools. So I guess I'd just be curious mm -hmm. to hear hear you say more about how, you know, how we can make this this leap into a non-linearity or non-separability. You know, the things that you've been talking about now for for a while in your work, um, if you could. So, live in nice, yes. The less no, but yes. <laughs> Uh, as a as a Foucault and Deleuze is usually some connections that I have been rejected, but I can see I definitely. Um, so Levinas was was important as I was writing toward the global idea of race precisely because of the, uh, he allows the distinction between those two moments of violence, and and the focusing on what I, I end up calling um, political symbolic, but but violence at the level of, of the presentation and that it's all over toward the global idea of race. And um, I say Deleuze no, but I'm more and more closer to, to, to that. But I think where I, where, I, um, where I arrive with, maybe that sounds a little pretentious, but I think this is it, um, is at, uh, at the metaphysical itself. Um, so as somebody who was trained initially as a Foucaultian and then I found the construction, it's right, and I became totally unhappy with both of them um, because the critique, of the, you know, the critique of the metaphysics of presence is not a critique of metaphysics or of the metaphysics that allows for presence in, in such a way. Um, and with and the large image of thought, I think, is a description of it's a meta, it's a metaphysics that have reference to the metaphysical. So yes, <laughs> that's the other way of answering one of the questions that I didn't want to talk about, say, metaphysics, but it's basically what, it, yeah, the level. And that, and, but, I'm calling, but I'm calling it intrastructural because, because the meta gives you that separation, that sense, right? It, we inscribe some kind of Kantian division between the sensible and the super sensible. Um, but I think it's not. I think it's material. Uh, this, this transformation is an inherent, is inherent in the matter. It's like those tiny little things, they, they are that, in, infinitely transferring, transforming, and becoming something else. Um, in that sense, like it's about, it's our bodies are also that, right? Uh, every moment and all moments, um, precisely that. And that is metaphysic. Metaphysics, you know, in the end, as because it is, you know, Deleuze calls this image, the image of thought, but is actually totally physical material in the, in that sense, and not at all formal. Um, which is also a distinction difficult to make, um, because I I had a student in my classroom the other day saying that 
they were annoyed with the, the abstraction because we were reading somebody who was make, advancing a critique of Kant, but it was abstract. And it was for, yeah, it was abstract and formal. And I said, well, you, you know, that is the Kantian distinction between the formal and the practical and et cetera, but, and the empirical. Uh, but it's also, that is also the fact that sometimes we build formal tools in order to you know, engage with something that can only be engaged in such a way. And those abstractions are not necessarily bad unless they are used as the answer f for the question of what something is. If they are ontological, then that is, we have a problem. But if they are methodological, if it is a how of approaching things, um, so this is like this, the, the metaphysical to me is also kind of like a how, um, because I also don't want to make any statement of that um, matter is just that, but I just say, but that, that, that how, how existence seems to be all about. So how, how about to think with that? Um, so if I could just follow up with one thing, uh, that's very interesting what you're saying. Do you, do you find it necessary or do you think it's necessary to give an account of how it is the, the material experience or the materiality of these of this kind of separation that you're talking about or nonlinearity how that actually um, how that actually can change the way that we we think and experience I guess I'm asking isn't there a conceptual dimension right or even a linguistic dimension you know a cognitive conceptual dimension that you know another step where where the material in in the in the chain of explaining how the material can do what it is you're saying. I mean, I'm I'm not asking with any agenda in mind. I'm mm -hmm. ge genuinely curious about how you would answer the question. You're asking if that is a linguistic, a descriptive. Well, I'm asking if I'm I'm asking can can the material itself give us give what is necessary to change those entrenched ways of thinking or even. But you know those metaphysically entrenched mm -hmm. ways of thinking, but also historically entrenched ways of thinking, obviously uh, racially entrenched ways of thinking, etc. You know, maybe I don't. I really don't know. I fear that if we try, we are going to colonize it somehow. Um, so that's why I keep doing it with the images, whether it's in the films or in the writing, um, approximating, like trying to mess you know the presentation up so as it appro approximates that but without um, I think it's that's why it's an image right and if um, yeah as I was talking to uh, Anselia and Maria if you know if I can if she she could see exactly what I was doing the image that I was doing the, so that's it the question is can it be translated into something that will be operative in terms of the political struggles and the ethical demands that we make? I think it will, but it will be at the level of affect, right? Because that's what the image is. Um, you know, it it open, creates a possible for an appreciation, an atten attention to uh, calls your attention to. You want to look at the same lake in the same way, uh, you know. I always like to remind people that you know my that my my laptop, which is now here, whatever, the copper there, just keeps me at, you know attached to connected to whatever is happening in the DRC. So if I go about life knowing that and doing and acting accordingly, then do we need to write a treatise? Maybe, but I think we also need. That's why I'm saying it's an appeal to the imagination. I think. That's the level where we need to shift because the link discursive one we have um, we have said it so many times, um, and we will continue to. It's not that we should ignore or stop being critical. Or whatever. That's not what I, what I'm saying, but I'm saying that we also need to um, attend to that other moment, the one which uh, escapes primarily because we we are we assume that just shifting the words, redefining them. Be stating it will we'll do the work. Uh, she's asking Is Professor Ferreira suggesting when waters, resources, raw materials, etc., are extracted, are, so are the ancestors as they are comprised of the resources extracted? 
and that the returning of the resources is not just economical homecoming, but also an ancestral homecoming and returning and reinvoking of the of these ancestral energies. Um, I don't know. I don't think I'm saying all of that, but I'm saying that the claim, the demand, is an ancestral demand. Demand is a demand as a claim. Um, for as a claim that it's grounded and supported because the connection is ancestral and that it's material to I'm not I the energy is returning I think it's kind of difficult isn't it because it's everywhere <laughs> it's in everything um, but it's the claim that it should be supported the realization the materialization of that claim will take different ways forms right um, different modalities, hopefully decolonization, but that we know it's a complicated thing, but anyway. Thank you. And we have another question from Luciana Parazzi. Um, thank you, Denise, for sharing your thinking with us today, and apologies, I'm not there in person. I am wondering about the role of imagination to summon the ancestry and the collapse of time, and you were discussing today. What is about imagination that offers the possibility of collapsing as opposed to something else outside transcendental metaphysics? Um, again, uh, what is it about the imagination and, and not something else? Or what, what is the collapsing, something that the imagination can do alone? I, I, I focus on the, on the imagination Assuming because of the assumption, of course, in this in this choice, um, that it is it is a moment, you know, the moment in which that is an openness. Thinking about people who think, you know, with modern tools, an openness to everything, um, right? It's that moment. How? But then the next step that is not a temporal one, but it is the organizing of that thing. Now, our imagination assumes that everything is already organized, and that's how we can or arrange and know it, that order of nature, the order of nature. Um, and what I'm interested in is in cultivating some stance you know, towards existence that does not presume that what, what exists is already ready for me to go and know in a very particular way. Um, So I think it's different than um, thinking that the, there is some if, if efficacy in the imagination that that, that you you know activate it and something else will happen. Not there is no I, I don't. Of course, there is a second step in which I'm in, in, invested in, but I'm not attributing it to say there is the imagine, imagination and then if we image this way. Then that's going to be efficacy again. But when we, you know, if you ima you can imagine standing before, you know, something like having my second part of the experiment, in which the dots all of a sudden come alive, come to life, and become something else. That is, we're imagining that. That it's, it, it is imaginable, isn't it? So the question is, what if that is how we imagine the, you know, what's called nature or the world? Um, and that's the move. That's the move. Different image of existence. That's the move. And has to be enough in a way. Time. Just wanted to. Uh, congratulate you. I do think that uh, language is kind of, uh, it doesn't allow us to think, um, for example, like cosmovisions of uh, people in the Andes. Uh, and maybe Professor Mignolo could tell us about how um, the Quechua language, uh, I think, doesn't have a past tense, right? Um, it's not gendered. And so, yes, definitely language is sometimes, I think, very. Um, um, it limits us. Um, but also, thank you because you brought to my mind and to my heart um, the struggles of Berta Cáceres, of the um, people who were defending the Huapinol River, 
of uh, the Garifuna people in Honduras, mm -hmm. um, of course, the people from the Amazon defending the river. Um, and so it almost brought me to tears at the end of your presentation because um, I think knowing that we are all interconnected is such a crucial thing to keep in mind um, in the way that you are, you know, putting these uh, arguments out there for people to really understand it. Um, it's just such an important um, exercise that we need to continue doing. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Yeah.